This video presentation and its accompanying materials are copyrighted by the American Association for Respiratory Care, AARC. Any public display, sale, copy, or distribution of the video or materials may only be undertaken with the prior written consent of the AARC. As a registered participant, you are authorized to duplicate course materials for this program for each participant viewing at your facility. This presentation and accompanying materials can be used by staff within the institution, but cannot be resold, distributed, or displayed for profit. Copyright 2018. All rights reserved. The following is a presentation of the American Association for Respiratory Care. Welcome to Current Topics in Respiratory Care. Today's topic is Role of the Respiratory Therapist in Tracheostomy Care. Dr. Dean Hess is a registered respiratory therapist and fellow of the AARC. He is a respiratory therapist at Massachusetts General Hospital and a teaching associate of anesthesia at Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. Dr. Hess is also managing editor for Respiratory Care Journal. Dr. Hess discloses relationships with Phillips Respironics, Ventec Life Systems, Jones and Bartlett, McGraw-Hill, Pulmonary Disease Board, ABIM, Daedalus Enterprises, and UpToDate. The objectives of this presentation are to describe the various styles and sizes of tracheostomy tubes, to discuss the timing of tracheostomy tube changes, to list factors to be considered before decannulation, to explain the role of the respiratory therapist on a tracheostomy team, and to compare methods to facilitate speech in a tracheostomized patient who is mechanically ventilated and also those who are breathing spontaneously. The first point that I want to make in this presentation is that a trach tube is not a trach tube is not a trach tube. And what I mean by that is that trach tubes vary in their shapes and in their dimensions among commercially available tubes. And that is not to say that one tube is superior to another, but what that is to say is that we as respiratory therapists need to select the tube that best meets the anatomy of the individual patient. As is shown on this slide, there are some trach tubes that are angled in their shape. There are others that are curved tubes and we need to select the type that will best fit the anatomy of our individual patient. Also shown on this slide is that the dimensions of tracheostomy tubes vary among manufacturers. Again, this is not a statement that one is better than the other. The important point for us as respiratory therapists is to appreciate that the outside diameters and the length of tracheostomy tubes change for the same number of trach tube. For example, if you look at this slide, if you look at a number eight trach tube, among manufacturers, there are different lengths of the tube. There are different outside diameters for the same inside diameter. Again, not a statement that one is better than the other, but a, a statement that we need to appreciate that there are differences and to choose the tube that best meets the anatomy of the individual patient. Here is an example from a real clinical case of a patient who I helped to care for a few years ago. This patient has a tracheostomy tube that is 73 millimeters in length. It is a number eight tube. And what we appreciated on the chest x-ray, both the plain film and the CT, is that the tube was abutting against the posterior tracheal wall. Not a good thing. And what we did in this patient was we switched from a tube of one manufacturer to a tube of another manufacturer, which gave, the, gave us a tube that had additional length, and that tube best fit the anatomy of this patient. And again, that's not to say that we should always use one type of tube versus another. In fact, I think what it is a statement of is that we should have a variety of tubes so that we can select the one that best meets the anatomy of the individual patients. There are several examples that I can 
uh, show on this slide of tubes that are not fitting in the airway very well. Here are some examples of poorly fitted tracheostomy tubes where the distal end of the trach tube is abutting against the posterior tracheal wall. Here is an example of tracheal malacia and tracheal collapse where the tube is not fitted very well in the airway to address that problem. Here is an example of granulation tissue that has developed as a result of a poorly fitting trach tube. So one of the messages then from this presentation is that we as respiratory therapists should assess trach tube position as part of our care of tracheostomized patients. And if the tube is not fitting very well in the airway, then we need to select a different tracheostomy tube so that there will be a better fit. My colleagues and I studied this a number of years ago now in a respiratory acute care unit where all of the patients being referred to this unit had a tracheostomy tube in place. And we found in this retrospective examination of our practice that about 10% of the patients being referred to this unit had a malpositioned tracheostomy tube. So that is one in 10 patients who had their tracheostomy tube uh, not correctly fitted to the anatomy of the patient. So certainly something that we as therapists should be aware of because if we look for it, we will see it likely in a surprising number of cases. The other thing that we found in this study was that the, in the majority of cases, the type of malposition was that the tracheostomy tube was abutting against the posterior tracheal wall of the patient. This is something that we could appreciate on bronchoscopy, is that the distal end of the trach tube was partially occluded with the posterior tracheal wall. The most common response to that was that we changed out the tracheostomy tube. So in about 90% of the cases when we saw a malpositioned tracheostomy tube, we addressed that by choosing another tracheostomy tube that better fit into the anatomy of the patient. And this is not a trivial problem. The other thing that we found in this study was that in patients with tracheostomy tube malposition, they tended to spend more time on the ventilator. So it prolonged the amount of time on the ventilator, likely because the patient was failing spontaneous breathing trials because of the malpositioned tracheostomy tube. There are commercially available from several manufacturers extra length tracheostomy tubes. There are tracheostomy tubes that have proximal extra length. So these tubes we might use in a patient with a thick neck, for example, or in a patient with morbid obesity. There are also trach tubes that have distal extra length. These tubes extend further into the trachea. So we might use a distal extra length tracheostomy tube in a patient who has some anomaly of the trachea, such as tracheomalacia or tracheal stenosis, so that the tube can extend past the area of, uh, of concern in the trachea. There are also fixed flange extra length hyperflex tubes. These tubes will bend at any point along the shaft of the tube. So we may have a patient who needs both proximal and distal extra length on the tracheostomy tube. Or we may have a patient who needs an extra length tracheostomy tube but neither a proximal or a distal extra length tube fits well. In this case, we can use the hyperflex tube because this tube will bend at any point along the shaft of the tube and in that way better fit the anatomy of the patient. There are available adjustable flange tracheostomy tubes. Sometimes it is difficult with a standard fixed flange tracheostomy tube to have the tube fit 
correctly in the trachea. With an adjustable flange tube, we can unlock the flange, we can position the tube correctly in the trachea, and then we can uh, lock the flange into place. I typically think of an adjustable flange tracheostomy tube as a temporary tube so that this might be a tube that we would use until we could special order a tracheostomy tube that will fit the, more specifically fit the, uh, the exact anatomy of the patient's airway. The, I found that with the adjustable flange tracheostomy tube, sometimes the flanges don't hold very well over time. So again, uh, making the point that these should be considered a temporary tube until we can special order a tube for the patient. Trach tubes can either be cuffed or uncuffed. So with an uncuffed tracheostomy tube, this allows for secretion clearance, such as with suctioning. It provides little or no protection from aspiration, and positive pressure ventilation is not as effective with an uncuffed tracheostomy tube. But that said, there are some patients who can be adequately ventilated with positive pressure ventilation, even with an uncuffed tracheostomy tube. A cuffed tracheostomy tube also allows for secretion clearance. It provides more protection from aspiration with the cuff inflated, although there still might be microaspiration of upper airway secretions into the trachea, and with a cuffed tracheostomy tube, positive pressure ventilation will be more effective. There are several types of cuffs that are available on tracheostomy tubes. The most common is the high volume, low pressure cuff, which is air inflated. I think the vast majority of tracheostomy tubes have this type of cuff. There are also cuffs that are tight to shaft cuffs that are water inflated. They need to be water inflated rather than air inflated because it, the cuff material is very non-compliant and it takes a higher amount of pressure to inflate the cuff. And if we inflated the cuff with air, the air would tend to diffuse across the, the cuff wall and we would uh, lose the inflation of the cuff. With the tight, tight to shaft water inflated cuffs, when the cuff is deflated, the tube is virtually identical to a non-cuffed tracheostomy tube. So a tight to shaft tracheostomy tube might be used in a patient where the cuff is deflated through most of the day and the patient can breathe more easily through the upper airway and we can apply a speaking valve or a decannulation uh, cap and because the tube with the cuff deflated uh, is similar to an on-cuff tracheostomy tube. There's less resistance around the tube to breathe through the upper airway. However, I do not recommend this tube for a patient who needs the cuff inflated all the time for positive pressure ventilation. So the tube might be used if the cuff is deflated for much of the day, but then needs to be inflated while the patient is on positive pressure ventilation, such as with nocturnal ventilation. There are also foam-filled cuffs. These are not as commonly used today as they were in the past. With a foam cuff, the inside of the cuff uh, contains foam, and the cuff inflates due to the expansion of the foam rather than by having air injected into the cuff. The intent with the foam cuff is that because the cuff is self-inflating due to the foam material, that there is less pressure exerted against the tracheal wall. However, I don't think that that has been conclusively shown to be the fact and these uh, cuffs with the uh, foam uh, within the cuffs sometimes do not seal very well in the airway. And the newest type of cuff to come on to the market is the tapered cuff. The idea of the tapered cuff is that it might 
uh, minimize the amount of micro aspiration around the cuff. That is certainly the intent. However, I think that my own read of the literature is that the evidence is not very strong uh, for the taper cuff reducing the amount of micro aspiration. I think that's really uh, yet to be determined. This is one of the things that we want to avoid with the cuff on the tracheostomy tube. You can see the amount of tracheal dilation in this patient as a result of overinflation of the cuff. We want to avoid certainly this degree of tracheal dilation due to cuff overinflation by paying close attention to the correct inflation of the trach tube. So this then brings us to a discussion of tracheostomy tube cuff pressure. The tracheal capillary pressure normally is about 25 to 35 millimeters of mercury, but it's known that if the cuff pressure is less than 20 centimeters of water, there's an increased aspiration risk. There's an increased risk of aspiration of upper airway secretions into the lower respiratory tract. Thus, it is commonly recommended to set the cuff pressure at 20 to 30 centimeters of water because higher cuff pressures are injurious to the tracheal wall and lower cuff pressures increase the risk of aspiration of upper airway secretions. I generally discourage the use of minimal leak and minimal occlusion techniques to inflate the cuff. I think many times those approaches result in cuff pressures that are too low, less than 20 centimeters of water, and that increases the risk of aspiration of upper airway secretions to the lower respiratory tract, and then those secretions could result in a pneumonia for the patient, certainly something we want to avoid. There are currently available, recently have come onto the market, uh, methods to continuously monitor and inflate the cuff on tracheostomy tubes and endotracheal tubes. I think it remains to be determined whether patient outcomes are improved with continuous monitoring and inflation of the cuff on the trach tube. Trach tubes can be single cannula tubes or they can be dual cannula tubes. The dual cannula tracheostomy tube has an inner cannula. On some types of tracheostomy tubes, the ventilator attachment, the 15 millimeter, di uh, the 15 millimeter ventilator attachment is on the inner cannula. So in those cases, if the patient is receiving positive pressure ventilation, we need to have the inner cannula in place within the tracheostomy tube. The use of a tube with an inner cannula allows cleaning and replacement of the inner cannula. This may reduce biofilm formation because the inner cannula is replaced periodically. The clinical importance of that, I think, is yet to be determined. The inner cannula can be removed to restore a patent airway if the tube occludes. So certainly I would recommend that if a patient is having issues with frequent tracheostomy tube occlusions with secretions or with crested secretions, we might consider the use of an inner cannula because if the tube occludes, it's much easier to change out the inner cannula than to change out the entire trach tube. The inner cannula will occlude fenestrations in the trach tube. If we use a fenestrated trach tube, and we'll talk a bit more about fenestrated trach tubes in a few minutes, it is important to appreciate that the inner cannula reduces the inner diameter of the trach tube, and that can increase the imposed work of breathing for a spontaneously breathing patient. For a mechanically ventilated patient, it results in a little bit more airway pressure needing, needed to be applied. But in particular, the patient breathing spontaneously, we need to be concerned that the inner cannula may increase the inspiratory work of breathing of the patient. The issue of changing the dimensions of the tube, if using a dual cannula tube or a tube with an inner cannula versus a single cannula tube is illustrated here. 
So here are two tubes by the same manufacturer. One is a single cannula tube, one is a dual cannula tube. And you can see that if we were to change from a number eight single cannula tube to a number eight dual cannula tube, we reduce the inside diameter of the tube and we increase the outside diameter of the tube. And one of the things that I have actually done in my own practice is in patients who I'm trying to wean away from the trach and patients who I'm working towards decannulation is to switch the patient from a dual cannula tube with an inner cannula to a single cannula tube because there's less resistance to inspiration through the trach tube and with the cuff deflated there's less resistance to exhalation around the outside of the trach tube with the single cannula tube and with the application of a speaking valve or a decannulation cap. This was demonstrated in a paper published in Respiratory Care a few years back now showing that with tracheostomy tubes, there's less resistance than there is through an endotracheal tube. That's because the tube is shorter. Also making the point that the smaller the tube size, the greater is the work of breathing for the patient. And in this study, the authors looked at the amount of work that needed to be performed by the diaphragm of spontaneously breathing patients. And in fact, by changing the tube from one with a lower inside diameter to a higher inside diameter, there was a significant reduction in the amount of work done by the diaphragm in some patients. So one of the things then that we might want to consider is drawing the steps that we take towards decannulation, that we may need to change out the tracheostomy tube to one that has a smaller outside diameter and uh, perhaps find one that, with the, that ideally uh, has the, uh, at the most adequate outside and inside diameter. Just a word about fenestrated tracheostomy tubes. Early in my career, we used these a fair amount. In recent years, at least in my career, we have used them less commonly. The idea of a fenestrated tracheostomy tube is that there are openings in the posterior wall of the trach tube in the trachea, which allows the patient to use their upper airway when the inner cannula is removed, the cuff is deflated, and a speaking valve or decannulation cap is applied. So if we take out the inner cannula to expose the fenestrations, and if the fenestrations are properly positioned in the trachea, then when we deflate the cuff and we apply a speaking valve, for example, the patient can exhale around the tube and also can exhale through the fenestrations of the tube through the upper airway. The issue, the practical issue with fenestrated tracheostomy tubes is that sometimes the fenestrations do not fit very well in the trachea. If the fenestrations do not fit very well in the trachea, if the fenestrations are abutting against the tracheal wall, that causes two problems. One problem is that the fenestrations are ineffective. In that point, they're not doing what they're supposed to do. But the other thing is that the fenestrations abutting against the tracheal wall can result in the formulation of granulation tissue within the trachea. And in, in, in some patients, that is potentially uh, a big issue. There are now tracheostomy tubes that are available from several manufacturers that allow the suctioning of secretions from above the cuff on the tracheostomy tube. These are the so-called subglottic suction tubes. The idea here is that we can aspirate secretions either intermittently or continuously from above the cuff on the tube and that way to minimize the aspiration of upper airway secretions into the lower respiratory tract and in that way potentially reduce the risk of pneumonia 
in our patients. Whether or not these types of tubes should be used for routine practice, I think remains to be determined. However, I do believe that in selected patients, particularly patients who have large volumes of upper airway secretions, these tubes can be quite helpful. And I've used them in some of my own patients who were having issues with large volumes of upper airway secretions and leakage of large volumes of those secretions into the lower respiratory tract. Now, a practical clinical question that comes up from time to time is how frequently should we change the tracheostomy tube for a patient? Should we put it in and keep it in indefinitely, or should we change out the tracheostomy tube periodically? How frequently should we change the trach tube? So indications for changing the trach tube include changing the type of the tube. So if the tube is malpositioned in the airway, then we certainly want to change the trach tube to one that better fits the anatomy of the patient's airway. We may change the trach tube because we want to downsize the size of the tube as part of the decannulation process. We may want to downsize the tube so that when we let the cuff down and we put on a speaking valve, there's more room around the outside of the tube for the patient to exhale through the upper airway. If the tube breaks, such as if the cuff on the tube breaks, we need to change out the tube. But the bigger question, and I think the unresolved question, is whether we should change out trach tubes on a routine basis. And the practice varies a lot around the country and around the world. There are some places that change out trach tubes very frequently and other places much less frequently. In one study, it was shown that 15% of survey respondents reported being aware of a death associated with the trach tube change. So that might give us a little bit of pause if we're considering doing frequent changes of the trach tube. May not be a benign procedure for all patients. It has also been shown in a study that I was part of that we published in Respiratory Care is if we change, if we perform the first trach change sooner, before day seven, that is associated with earlier use of a speaking valve and with earlier oral intake. In many hospitals, I think the practice is that once the trach tube is placed, the first trach tube change does not occur before day seven. And in this study, we found that by changing out the trach tube sooner, often changing the trach tube that, to one that better fit the anatomy of the patient resulted in earlier use of a speaking valve, earlier oral intake use. This is a study that I find quite fascinating. Actually, I find this study very fascinating. In this study, the authors with an electron microscope looked at trach tubes that had been in place in a patient over some period of time. And what they found was that in all of the tubes that were exposed in the trachea for three to six months, revealed a major degradation and changes in the surface of the material. And they recommended that polymetric tracheostomy tubes, such as the one shown on this slide, should be changed before the end of three months of clinical use. I think I find these electron micrographs to be very fascinating. You don't have to be an expert in plastics to appreciate the uh, breakdown that you can see in some of these trach tubes. So, so these data would then suggest that perhaps we should be changing out trach tubes every th two to three months to avoid breakdown that is occurring in the tubes that could lead to uh, that could have clinical importance. Now let's change our discussion to one of decannulation. So how can we identify when the patient no longer needs a tracheostomy tube, and then how do we go about removing the tracheostomy tube? How do we, what is the process that we should follow going from a tracheostomy tube in place to the patient not having the tracheostomy tube or being decannulated. The usual process that I think is followed and certainly 
consistent with my own practice, is that we first evaluate how well the patient tolerates cuff deflation. If we deflate the cuff and we find that the patient is aspirating a lot of upper airway secretions into the lower respiratory tract, then perhaps we are not quite so enthusiastic about decannulating this patient. If the patient tolerates cuff deflation, then we will often assess how well the patient tolerates a speaking valve. These are available from several manufacturers, and we'll talk more about speaking valves in just a few minutes. If the patient tolerates the speaking valve well, where they can breathe in through the trach tube and exhale through their upper airway, then we will progress to capping of the tube with a decannulation cap which now requires the patient to breathe in and out through the upper airway, and the patient tolerates that, then we should consider decannulating the patient, just taking out the tracheostomy tube. Here are the results of a study that I was part of some years ago, where we surveyed experts from uh, all over the world. So this was an international survey, and we asked them questions about how they determine when a patient is ready for decannulation. And the most important factors that came out of this survey is that clinicians thought that the level of consciousness was important, alert versus drowsy, that the patients had a good cough, an effective cough, strong versus weak, that the patient's secretions were scant thin versus moderate and thick, and the, the oxygenation requirement of the patient was not very high. 95% oxygen saturation on an FiO2 of 0.3 versus 95% on an FiO2 of 0.5. Now I should point out that this survey did not evaluate best practice, it evaluated what is the common practice that clinicians with expertise in tracheostomy management are using to determine when a patient can be decannulated. And as I look at the indicators on this slide, these are common sense things. These are common sense types of assessments that we might consider before decannulating our patient. I also think that it's interesting, we did a secondary analysis of this data comparing responses of respiratory therapists and physicians, and it was interesting that respiratory therapists more highly valued the patient's ability to tolerate capping of the tracheostomy tube, whereas physicians more highly valued the level of consciousness of the patient. So this can then, I suspect, lead to some uh, discussion and debate at the bedside where the respiratory therapist may feel that it is safe to go ahead and decannulate the patient because they've tolerated the decannulation cap for maybe one, two, three days, whereas our physician colleagues may not be comfortable with that if the patient's level of consciousness is not very good. There are also commercially available stomal maintenance devices. Sometimes we will have a patient who we feel is ready for decannulation, but we're a little concerned that the patient might fail the decannulation and we need to put the trach tube back in place. There are devices like the Olympic button and the Montgomery cannulas that can be used to maintain the stoma so that if we need to put the trach tube back in, we can take out this device and put the trach tube back in place. Another place where I've used these sometimes is that we have a patient who can be decannulated, but in a week or 10 days, the patient is going to require some surgery where they'll need an airway. So we put in the stomal maintenance device and then the tracheostomy tube can be reinserted temporarily during that procedure. An area of some controversy is whether it is safe to care for tracheostomized patients in the general wards of the hospital. And there is some debate about this in the literature. 
There are some studies that have shown that that might not be so safe. There are other studies that have shown that it is not a problem. And I suspect that it might depend upon the patient and it might depend upon the skills of the providers who are taking care of that patient. And a point here that I would make to us, to all of us as respiratory therapists, it is, is that it is important that we bring our expertise to the bedside of or patients with tracheostomy tube in the general ward. So I think a way that we can improve outcomes of patients with tracheostomy in the general wards is to have them seen on a regular basis by a respiratory therapist. A few of my colleagues and I wrote an editorial about this topic in critical care medicine a few years ago where we proposed this decision tree where we asked the question, is the patient ready for decannulation? This is the patient in the ICU, so we're considering transferring the patient with tracheostomy to, from the ICU out to the wards. So we ask ourselves the question, is the patient ready for decannulation? And then certainly decannulate the patient before they leave the ICU if we can do that. Many times that may not be possible. So then we do not decannulate the patient, but we need to then consider whether the patient is at high risk of complications. And if the patient is at high risk of complications, the patient may be better served to spend some additional time in the ICU or to be transferred to a step-down unit rather than to the general wards. If the patient is at low risk of complications, then we can transfer the patient to the wards, but the patient should be seen on a regular basis by a respiratory therapist and by a tracheostomy team, including a respiratory therapist. So this then will segue us to a discussion of tracheostomy teams. A tracheostomy team is a multidisciplinary team who sees patients with tracheostomy often as a group on a regular basis and makes recommendations about the management of the tracheostomy process, such as use of speaking valves, decannulation, uh, caps, uh, when the patient's ready for decannulation, and so forth. Multidisciplinary teams typically include a physician, a nurse, a speech-language pathologist, and then very importantly, a respiratory therapist. So a way that we as respiratory therapists can contribute to the care of patients with tracheostomy is by our participation in a trach team. This was a systematic review and meta-analysis published a few years back that found that there is low quality evidence that multidisciplinary tracheostomy care contributes to a reduction in tracheostomy time and an increase in speaking valve use, and there was insufficient evidence to determine that multidisciplinary tracheostomy teams reduce hospital or ICU length of stay. Now, as is the case with any systematic review and meta-analysis, there will typically be new studies that get published that may cause us to update how we might think about this subject. And in the case of tracheostomy tubes, there are two recent papers, two more recent papers that have been published that I believe support the use of a tracheostomy tube. This is a paper looking at the value of a low risk tracheostomy clinical pathway. And what they found in this study was that at baseline in this hospital, the time to decannulation was on average a bit more than two weeks. They found that with implementation of the pathway, they reduced the time to decannulation to less than a week. And in follow-up with the more longer-term use of this pathway, they found that decannulation time was just a little bit over a week, uh, certainly much shorter than it was at baseline. 
with the use of the pathway in this study, there was no association between adverse events and the use of the pathway. And a point that I want to make here is that instrumental in the application of this pathway was the role of a respiratory therapist. And you can see that there's a respiratory therapist who is one of the co-authors on this study. Again, making the point of the value of respiratory therapist in the care of patients with tracheostomy. In this study, the authors looked at a comprehensive, multidisciplinary approach to post-tracheostomy care. In other words, this was a study looking at the value of a multidisciplinary trach team. And what they found was with the implementation of this multidisciplinary team, there was a significant increase in the number of patients who could be decannulated before they left the hospital. And I think this is an impressive increase in the number of patients decannulated as the result of implementing this multidisciplinary trach team approach. And a point that I will make here again is that an important member of this trach team was the respiratory therapist. The final thing we'll talk about in this presentation is how we facilitate speech in a patient with tracheostomy. In patients who are not mechanically ventilated and breathing spontaneously, we can use a talking trach tube. We can deflate the cuff and use finger occlusion of the trach tube to facilitate speech. We can deflate the cuff and apply a speaking valve. In mechanically ventilated patients, we can again use a talking trach tube. We can let down the cuff on the trach tube and provide leak speech. So some of the breath delivered from the ventilator leaks through the upper airway and facilitates speech. Or we can let the cuff down and place a speaking valve between the ventilator circuit and the tracheostomy tube. Speaking valves are available from several manufacturers. There are some concerns that we should appreciate as respiratory therapists when placing a speaking valve. One concern is the potential for upper airway obstruction because with the speaking valve, the patient inhales through the tracheostomy tube and exhales through the upper airway. So that'll be a problem if there's upper airway obstruction. We may be concerned about aspiration with the cuff deflated, so we would never use a speaking valve without first deflating the cuff, so there's some concern for aspiration. However, the risk of aspiration might actually be reduced with the use of a speaking valve. So exhaling through the upper airway might actually reduce the risk of aspiration to some extent. We need to consider resistance around and through the tracheostomy tube. So if the tube is too large, then there will be outside resistance during exhalation. So we might think about downsizing the tube, using a fenestrated tube, using a cuffless tube, using a tight to shaft cuff, some of the things that we had talked about previously. And if the tube is too small, then the inside resistance during inhalation may be an issue, and if it's a dual cannula tube, we can address that by taking out the inner cannula. With the cuff deflated and a speaking valve in place, we also need to appreciate that the patient can inhale not only through the tracheostomy tube, but also through the upper airway. And in some patients, that will result in desaturation because of the patient breathing room air in through the upper airway, and we can address that by applying supplemental oxygen, such as a nasal cannula, to the upper airway. One of the concerns then that I had already pointed out is that with the use of a speaking valve, if the tube is too large or if there is upper airway obstruction, the patient will have difficulty exhaling. And one of the things that we can do as respiratory therapists to assess that is to measure the tracheal pressure. So this shows the setup of a system that can be applied to the trach tube with a speaking valve to objectively measure the pressure in the trachea during exhalation. If you attach the speaking valve, 
and the patient is needing to generate more than about 10 centimeters of water in the trachea during exhalation, then there's a lot of resistance to exhalation. So we should think about downsizing the tracheostomy tube or assess the upper airway for some obstruction. There are now several trach tubes that are commercially available that allow for speech with the cuff inflated. These are sometimes called talking trach tubes because it allows the patient to talk with the cuff inflated. The idea here is that there is a flow of air of say six or eight liters per minute that is passed into the trachea above the cuff on the tube. That air then exits through the upper airway. That air exits through the vocal cords and the patient can use that flow of gas to facilitate some speech. My own experience, and I think the experience of many, is that with a talking trach tube, with one of these types of trach tubes, the quality of the speech is not real great. Uh, often it's not much better than a whisper. However, if there is a contraindication to deflating the cuff, this is an approach that might allow the patient to be able to communicate with care providers and with family members. We can also facilitate speech in mechanically ventilated patients with the tracheostomy tube. There are several ways that we can address that. So one is to just let down the cuff on the tracheostomy tube. If we let down the cuff on the tube, then when the ventilator pushes air into the tracheostomy, some of that will ventilate the lungs, some of that will leak through the upper airway, and the gas that leaks through the upper airway, the patient can use for speech. A potential issue with that is that the greatest leak will be during inspiration. And the way that most of us normally breathe is during exhalation. So this can be a new way of speaking for patients with leak speech, where they will speak primarily during inspiration, which is when the leak will be the greatest. One thing we can do to increase the amount of leak during exhalation is apply PEEP to the ventilator. If we apply 8 or 10 or 12 centimeters of water of PEEP to the ventilator, if the cuff is deflated, now during exhalation, some of that pressure, much of that pressure, will leak through the upper airway and will allow the patient to speak during exhalation. And I have had patients who I've cared for with the use, where with the use of cuff deflation and leak speech, applying a peep of eight or 10 or 12 centimeters of water resulted in the patient having very good voice quality. And in some patients, they were able to speak throughout the respiratory cycle because we let the cuff down and then drawing inspiration there is leak as the tidal volume is being pushed into the trachea, which allows for speech during inspiration. And then the PEEP provides leak during exhalation so that the patient can speak through both the inspiratory and expiratory phase. It's really something quite intriguing uh, to see when it occurs. The other thing that we can do to facilitate flow through the upper airway with the cuff deflated uh, and with leak speech is to apply a speaking valve between the ventilator circuit and the tracheostomy tube so that with the speaking valve, the ventilator pushes the breath in during the inspiratory phase, during exhalation, all of that breath needs to exit through the upper airway and can be used for speech. And I know that speaking valves are commonly used in patients with tracheostomy to facilitate speech. Uh, something that gives me a little pause about that is if the patient were to obstruct their upper airway, the ventilator would keep pushing breath in, but it would not be able to exit, it would not be able to exit back out through the ventilator circuit. This is a study published a number of years ago now looking at leak speech with cuff deflation in tracheostomized patients, showing that without the use of a speaking valve, 
simply by letting down the cuff and making adjustments on the ventilator, the quality of the patient's speech can be improved. And in this study, they showed that lengthening the inspiratory time improves speech. So there's more leak during inspiration that allows speech during the inspiratory phase. Increasing the PEEP facilitates speech because there's more leak through the upper airway and that there was an additive effect of increasing the inspiratory time and adding PEEP. And in the bottom panel on this slide is shown how the speech quality improves by increasing the amount of PEEP from 5 to 8 to 12 centimeters of water. So then one of the take home messages I think for respiratory therapists is that there are manipulations that we can make on the ventilator to improve the quality of speech with cuffed down leak speech. In summary, tracheostomy tubes are available in a variety of sizes, shapes, and styles. Respiratory therapists like you and me should be knowledgeable of the variety of tube configurations that are available to meet our patient's needs. Respiratory therapists should be active on tracheostomy teams, offering clinical leadership as well as technical expertise. And there are a number of ways that we can facilitate speech in patients with tracheostomy, and that is very important in improving the quality of life of patients. Uh, I'm actually disappointed when I hear that there are some facilities where they never let cuffs down to allow patients with tracheostomy to speak. This is something where I think we as respiratory therapists can have an important impact in the quality of our patients' lives. And the final thing that I will leave you with is this citation. This is a paper that a colleague and I put together and published in Respiratory Care a few years ago. And everything that I talked about in this presentation is covered in detail in this article.